We're rolling, right, Brett? We're good? Okay, cool, man. Well, Will, really appreciate you joining me. Mr. Will Short, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. It always feels weird, like, we talk for a while, and then you have to formally introduce yourself, and it's like, well, bleh. You know, I don't want it to, uh, you know, make the throw the, the rails off the podcast. But so, Will, you told me you came up here from the Carrollton office, correct? That's correct. Okay, that's correct. It's, it's not too bad of a commute. I actually, I, I, we were talking about this before, and I don't know if you recall, and probably not because I was one of the analysts on your plan a long time ago. But I remember sitting down with you, and I think this Bart, correct, is yep. uh, co-founder at Ameriflex, and it's it's really interesting how. That's probably six or seven years have passed and things start to come full circle over time. And anyways, I really appreciate you, you joining me on the podcast today. Obviously, we talked about this ahead of time. We we're going to get into direct primary care as, uh, you know, maybe the core subject matter today. But before we do all that, before we talk about um, a little bit too much business, uh, the side of it, why don't we just get to know Mr. Will Short, a little personal information, education history. I'm sure it's pretty interesting. And from what I see on your LinkedIn resume, it's pretty extensive as well. So uh, the floor is yours, man, wherever you want to start. Well, that's, uh, you know, I think uh, the devil's favorite sin is vanity. So I don't know how interesting it is besides <laughs> for myself and for my mother. But uh, I'm from Kansas City, so big time Royals oh, fan. Right on. You know, which is, uh, you know, every 30 years, the moon comes in a certain degree where they win a World Series. And uh, I guess, you know, from that, I'm also a Chiefs fan. But being in Dallas, it's kind of hard not to be a Dallas fan. You're kind of inundated with it. At all Do you feel you have to be secretive about your support of the Chiefs or, or what? I don't think so because AFC, NFC, you know, the Hunt family, you know, down here. Sure. I, I don't think, you know, I don't think Cowboys fans really can never find a reason not to like the Chiefs and vice versa. Not like, you know, living in Philadelphia, totally different deal. I mean, the Eagles and the Cowboys, you think it's like a civil war of some sort of time <laughs> they get together. Yeah. Um, but, you know, grew up in Kansas City. Uh, both my parents are physicians. Uh, okay. They actually met over a dead body in med school at a cadaver, which is kind of weird and interesting all at the same time. That is. Yeah. Um, Care to unpack that a little more? Over, you know, over a dead body, literally over a dead body? Yeah, so in med school, you, you line up, I guess, apparently, um, at KU Med, where they went, um, by last name. And so, okay. obviously, my dad's last name is Short. My mom's last name is Sism, which is also interesting, a great split. Um, <laughs> and they got put on the same dead body. And so, I always tell the same joke my mother hates. And like, well, hopefully, I wasn't conceived on a dead body. But, well, you know, that's a story for another day, potentially. <laughs> God, I hope so. I hope that's not the case. Yeah, that'd be weird. But yeah. probably would probably explain a lot of things. Um, but grew up there, great place to grow up, still a family up there, um, went off to do undergrad in St. Louis um, at Washington University out there, and graduated early there to start my first business, which would be kind of described now as maybe a wellness business. Okay. Um, which I'm, business was that, by the way? Well, it was called HealthWise Fitness, Fitness RX, okay. um, and it was a piece of software that failed miserably, Okay. or, or maybe marvelously, I don't know, it depends how you look at it. And ended up in a basement back at my parents' house in uh, Olathe, Kansas, which was uh, an opportunity. So is the life. code still there somewhere? Are you sure maybe the market just wasn't ready for your solution yet? You know, it does exist. Okay. Um, I wouldn't bring it out to show it to anybody. It's pretty <laughs> embarrassing. Um, but, yeah, it was a colossal disaster, but an opportunity, I suppose. That's what people keep telling me. Mm -hmm. But uh, Was it a notion where you failed fast, though? You were able to figure out really quickly it didn't work, or did it take some time to figure that out? You know, it took about six months for me to figure out I had no idea what I was doing. Okay. Um, but the feedback was pretty good. I mean, every time I'd sit down with someone and say, hey, you know, we just took you from being unhealthy to healthier. How much is it worth to you? And they look at me like I was from another planet, and they'd say, well, Will, it's not worth anything. And I'm like, why is it not worth anything? Well, I've got a $10 copay. I'm like, what do you mean you have a $10 copay? Well, when I'm sick, I go to the doctor and I pay $10 and I'm better. And so at that point in time, I realized I wasn't addressing the actual fundamental issues that were driving why I wanted to start this type of business to begin with. Okay. And so that was your first foray. Obviously, you right out of school, you said you went and started this company. Was there a motivation or an inspiration to immediately go into that field? So uh, probably a little bit of kind of growing up in a household uh, with okay. physicians. I mean, we had um, growing up, you know, our dinnertime conversations were unique for mm -hmm. sure um, with uh, JAMA magazines, Journal of American Medicine magazines as coffee table books. You know, most people have like, you know, a flower book. We have like, you know, some weird STD that's conquering the, the Southern Hemisphere, <laughs> you know. So that's probably part of it. Um, and then just this, I had another business that was successful in college, and I just thought this would be something really neat in terms of this thing that kind of hit me in the, in the face, and that when I was in college, I realized very quickly that people were using insurance incorrectly. And then it was reinforced when I'd asked that question, at, when I'd finished someone through my, my beta cycle, um, that everyone viewed insurance, at least health insurance, as a payment mechanism. Mm -hmm. 
And so that, that didn't make sense to me. You don't use insurance. You don't use your car insurance to pay for gas or oil changes. You don't use your home insurance to pay for electricity. And so back then I was like, this makes no sense. Why are we doing this? And so the genesis of this business was if I could go into employers or groups, get the group overall healthier by stop eating cheesecake, you know, eat healthier foods, work out, and involve a primary care physician involved into that. And of course, I had a big influence. My dad was is a retired internist, and so he was a big influence in that thought and idea. Um, I thought maybe I could invoke change and have a business. But it failed because people didn't appreciate health until they didn't have it. And so, yeah, it's an interesting dichotomy, right? Uh, I, I've discovered that as well. I'm just by nature and by having some additional time in college, there's some transfers, uh, D1 transfers back and forth. I had some additional time uh, in undergrad, so I did an exercise science degree in addition to business. And it was just always a passion of mine, but it's also you, you realize pretty quickly that people have a really weird uh, relationship with the idea of health and fitness and stuff like that. But before I go down that path, I want to understand, how did you even come up with this notion that the payment methodology for healthcare was confusing? Like, were you roped into a you know, a claim of some sort, or were you just hearing over a dinner with your parents? What, what brought that up? Well, I actually um, spent some time in an energy trading company where I was brought in as an intern. Long story short, um, did some exams at the undergrad at WashU where they invited me to come for the summers to do a bunch of nerd stuff with okay. energy transfers and different things. And they put out an email saying anybody can present an idea, any idea, to the CEO and executive management head of HR. And so I thought, well, gosh, this is all about competing for the next summer between the other interns. Ultimately, the goal is could you again get an offer to come back to the firm? Um, and so I thought, well, gosh, I want to come up with an idea. And I thought, well, I bet most people are going to present an idea on like natural gas arbitrage opportunities in New Guinea or someplace. <laughs> so I thought, what if I could come up with something totally different? And what I realized that energy trans is like trading is like currencies. It doesn't stop. It's yes. 24 hours. These guys would come in, train to be energy traders, and they, by the time they were 35, they'd be burnt out. Mm -hmm. They either retired or dead, basically. And so the genesis of the thought was, if I could come up with a model that could keep them healthier to be able to work a little bit longer, would that be beneficial to the individual and the firm? And so then it became a quest for, what's the return on investment? How do you do that? And so literally my first generation of this business model was to build a gym, as crazy as that sounds. Within, the, within this company. An on-site? An on-site uh, cool. gym. And, but then I had to figure out a way, well, how is that going to be measured for return? And so then I started researching different things, and I came across the Framingham study that Harvard's been doing at Framingham, Connecticut, for like 60 years now. And I thought, well, that's interesting. They have all these people from this town that they've been tracking all kinds of biostats, and they've started to do some predictive modeling. So I took some of their predictive modeling, looked at some actuarial data in terms of how we look at underwriting individuals of certain types of you know, demographics, sex, age, biostats, and everything else. And from there, I put together, um, which basically at that point in time was just a spreadsheet to show you know, for the presentation. Okay. And, you know, that's kind of started it. Was, it. was there specific health outcomes you were focused on? Was it, you know, when you terms to quantifying that ROI, how does a gym deliver on that ROI over a certain period of time? What was the result of that? I mean, were you just showing maybe a, a certain projection of a, a declination in certain conditions or w overall health measures? What were you really latching onto there? So the big one is really just, um, you know, what, what's your lipid profile look like, your cholesterol levels look like, what's your age, what's your sex, and then ultimately your BMI, your what's okay. your weight. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately the biggest precursor that I was able to discover is weight and age. And so the goal being how do we get people healthier by making them be you know, using fitness and getting shape for that. And that was the argument. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I would believe the argument uh, on the surface for sure. And obviously would want to see the data, but so you, you, it's clear though, that you had an interest in and around the health field, but it, you didn't want to go into the mm -hmm. medical field. So right. how, how come there just seeing two parents do it and you're like, no, nope, I don't want to touch that. Or what, what was the reason why you decided to divert? Yeah, so my parents both being physicians, uh, my dad's a retired internist, my mom's a retired OBGYN, um, and when there's three of us, myself, my brother, and my sister, they talked us all out of going into medicine. Interesting. Um, they just said it's not worth it, um, it won't be like it was when we got in there, and it's going to be heavily controlled by the government. And this is, this is 25 sure. years ago. Um, and so we didn't, and all my brother and I went into more engineering. Uh, my sister went on to become a teacher and do some neat stuff in that area, um, and we just didn't go down that path. Well, it's, it's interesting. You know, my dad is in a completely unrelated field. He's in the construction business, um, has his own paving company, and he's been doing it for three decades. 
But in a similar uh, similar way, but obviously for different reasons, he also deterred me from wanting to go down that path. I think just simply because, you know, the, the nature of the work, obviously, it's very difficult out in the sun in Texas in the summer and those things. And then him being on the bottom of the totem pole in terms of being a subcontractor at the end of a job, everything sort of rolls down to you. But for, for many other reasons as well. But he's also like, hey, you don't want to do this. You go find something else to do. So obviously encourage school and things like that. Uh, but I just find it fascinating having two, two parents as doctors doctors, you would think that that was an obvious uh, path for you, but I, you know, I appreciate you carving out your own path and your parents obviously uh, guided you away from it. So when did you move from the wellness space to, was it Workforce Go was the next uh, entity or were these simultaneous? Am I getting that timeline correct? Yeah. So after I ended up uh, failing miserably at this, mainly because people weren't willing to sign a value or willing to pay for it. And so the genesis of the model after I built it and graduated early to go pursue it was I wanted to target s small employers. Thinking small employers and to target the executives, they'd be more apt to pay for this mm -hmm. and just pay whatever that means. And so it was really an early beta site in terms of what's this really worth. And when I had that aha moment where everyone was telling me, this is great, we're having a good time, we're not going to pay for it because I have insurance, it led me on a journey of like, wait a minute, okay, obviously they don't care about the financial implications of what could happen 10 years, 20 years from now. Right. Because no one cares about that. You don't think about that far. And very few people can plan ahead that far. And so I had this moment of, you know, maybe if people had a financial incentive to care about their health, maybe they would. And so serendipity, I'm literally thinking about these ideas. My things failed tremendously. And I'm like, well, gosh, I can't live in my parents' basement forever. This is kind of a, a failure across uh, multiple lines. How old were you at this point? You were probably early 20s still? Yeah, okay. so I was at this point just turned 21. Okay. So I'm already out of school doing these different things. And, um, and so I ended up getting a job interview with a logistics company in California. Went out there for the interview, and basically it was pretty neat. They wanted me to figure out, you know, job was figure out how to put more screws in a container. And if you could figure out, you know, you know, do this with some math, you know, that was their business. Okay. And I needed a book on my flight back to Kansas City. I was back in Kansas City. And I came across a book at LAX called The Wellness Revolution. Hmm. And it was by an economist, I mean, Dr. Uh, Paul Zane Pleiser. Okay. A, a PhD, not a medical doctor, a, a PhD in economics. Read it from cover to cover highlighted and took notes throughout. This book was destroyed by the time I landed at Kansas City <laughs> International Airport. And what they taught, what he talked about was one important thing. He started talking about, and it was a big part of his book, the Archer MSA. Okay. And so I looked and like, holy cow, here it is. If people had more Archer MSAs, then would they be more apt to maybe make a different choices in terms of how they're consuming healthcare, planning for healthcare? Did a bunch of research, learned that there was a pilot program started in 96. It's actually a uh, bipartisan effort, believe it or not. Ted Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, was one of the big people behind it um, in terms of pushing this through. And literally, say that was a Wednesday when I landed. Thursday, I'm in the, my where I'm doing this beta site, picking up my servers. And a gentleman that at the time, his name was Don Brain. He was uh, the head of employee benefits at Locked and happened to be one of my guys that went through this program. He comes in and he delivers me an Archer MSA custodial agreement. And he's like, William, I thought about you. And this came across my desk, and I thought you had to see this. And so I looked at it. And I'm like, well, this is really weird, right? It's almost yeah, like that moment of weirdness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, whoa, this is really strange. Yeah. And I happened to look at it, and the underlying custodial bank was UMB Bank, which is based in Kansas City. They're now down here in Dallas, Texas, and you know, expanding. Great company, great bank. And I did some more research, and I discovered that there were three banks in the country that were doing this pilot. UMB Bank. Mellon Bank of New York, and the Bank of Howard's Grove, which eventually became HSA Bank, which has been acquired by Webster Bank, but mo a lot of people have heard of HSA Bank. And I thought, this is too weird. So come Friday, I'm down in their HR department with a suit on, with a resume saying, I don't care where you put me. Yeah. I want to work on this program. That's awesome. So what did they say? What was their response to that? Well, I showed up, and they literally had no idea what to do with me. <laughs> they like, give an interview? I'm like, no. Well, like, you have to do these things. I'll wait. I'll fill out the application, and I waited. Mm -hmm. And so they interviewed me at the end of the day. And they had me come back. I did another review, and eventually they hired me. And they put me in another basement in the bank um, where I was in the credit department, started as a credit analyst. And I basically just started doing my work, get there about 6.30, 7 o'clock, get my credit analyst work done. And then I wrote a white paper on why the bank should expand their healthcare payment processing world 
um, and get into some FSA card issuance and some other things. And HR rates have just come on the on the scene. What year would this have been? When this this is uh, two th- uh, 2003. 2003. So okay. this is so HRAs just came in 2002, and so all these things coming together. And eventually, I earned enough vacation time. So I started in August. My business had <laughs> failed all the way up to that point, uh, and got three days of vacation and sat in the chairman's office for three days in November of 2003 to convince them to let me work on this. Um, and so that was kind of weird. I'm surprised he didn't call security. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, he met with me, a great guy, uh, the patriarch of the bank, uh, Crosby Kemper. And he said, well, this is very interesting. Um, but I'm, you know, I think more so he not caring what I actually wrote or was talking about. I think he was more impressed that I took vacation time to f- spend five minutes yeah. with the man. Yeah. And he said, well, I'll, I'll see what I can do with this. And so I think, well, we'll see what happens. Week later, uh, the head of investment banking, I named Pat Thompson, Came down the credit department. Said, "Okay, which one of them used William Short?" I was like, "Literally, no." You, you think you're in trouble at that point? Or? Well, yeah. I'm like, I'm sitting here, tube tube monitors, right? Yeah. You're so packed into these cubes, it'd be a COVID nightmare. There's no windows, and here's the head of investment banking come down, and like, where are you know, where's William Short? He said, "Walk with me." So I'm walking with him back to you know his domain. The entire time, he's tearing my white paper apart. It really? And he's really? like, "This is why I won't work. This is why I won't work. This is why it's you know disaster." And I'm like, well, this is great. I'm thinking to myself, well, this is an awesome start to the day. I'm, mm-hmm. you know, being told I'm an idiot. And then he goes, but I want you to come work for me because the fact that you did all these things is pretty impressive to me. And so I ended up in there, got my seven and my 63 over a number of months and worked for him for a little while. Well, did you disagree with his assertion that it didn't work or were you a little too hesitant to push back at the, in that moment or uh, would you have had uh, retorts to each one of his uh, complaints if, if you had the time to do so? So what, what happened was his, his reasons for it, and he was actually the guy that pushed for it, one of the guys that pushed for it in the bank for the pilot. Okay. So he was very well-versed, and that's why he took an interest when this, however this came up after my meeting with the, the executive chairman. And his reasons for why his fail were right on in terms of being a pilot program, a lot of requirements to it. And so I couldn't refute it. I'm like, well, okay, I get you. But hey, you saved me from the basement of the bank, so I'm pretty appreciative of that. Now exactly. I can move over here. And I thought, well, this was a nice try. I'll, I'll go into my world of you know maybe doing some bond trading, or and I did some stuff for the bank in terms of bond hedging strategies and some other things. But what happened was, if you follow the history of HSA, is that December 8th of 2003, the Medicare Modernization Act was signed. So this is like three weeks after my dreams of healthcare within a bank were destroyed, but now I'm in investment banking, and I took that law into Mr. Thompson's office, and I said, hey, remember all those reasons you told me it wouldn't work? Well, here's the new law, and I highlighted the creation of the HSA. And he said, okay. He took one look, and he goes, William, whatever you're working on right now, um, and I actually had to finish my 7 and 63 to get all that done and everything else, but once that's all completed, all I want you to do is work on developing this product. Okay. And that was the beginning of the UMB Healthcare Services Group. Interesting. So what was the culmination of that then? Because obviously we got a lot more to cover and we haven't really got off to you doing your own thing at this point. So how did that end up? So for the next uh, two and a half years, um, I was able to basically along the way recruit and convince people within the bank to help me. Um, You know, so I didn't have a budget. I didn't have uh, really other than Mr. Thompson giving me authority to do these things. So I gave myself my own little title. I started calling... um, like I need a card processor, so I called up to the bank's card processor, a company called First Data, which got recently acquired by FIS, and convinced them to basically do some things I needed them to do. Designed uh, on the bank side a sub-accounting process and a settlement process that allowed for um, to put FSA notional accounts and HRA accounts on, and an HSA account all on one card with our processor that allowed for these different rules of the time to play out. And then we took that and uh, started uh, installing business, started selling business. So the Assurance HSA Tools Program, the Humana Access Program, PayFlex, which was acquired by Aetna, um, a num- Cerner's Program, a number of different programs that came together, that all ran on that platform. Okay. Um, and so then that was kind of the beginning of all that and went on from there. Well, so yeah, yeah, just judging by your start to the your career world and how it all played out, I imagine it was only a matter of time, obviously, you went out in business on your own, right? You even started immediately after school. Obviously, that, that particular adventure didn't work out. But now you're building something for someone else. I imagine at some point you're like, well, why am I building this for somebody else, right? I mean, so when was it? When was the transition to, what was next, I guess? What was your first uh, business after 
after working for the, the bank. So there was a stopover about another two and a half years at First Tennessee Bank. Okay. And they wanted to start a healthcare division. And they hired me and pretty much my team. And we did that for them um, and built that out for them, which eventually got acquired by Health Equity, that okay. group there. Yeah. And in the, in the time frame of that, different strategies, but similar product lines in terms of what we did. Um, I started noticing a real um, issue in terms of these TPAs, if you call these third-party administrators, specifically in the FSA, HRA, HSA space. Okay. And knowing how what it took to put them on a card program, I realized a lot of their stuff was pretty inefficient, a lot mm -hmm. of paper-based. And so started to go out and look at different strategies to acquire smaller ones, um, acquired Ameriflex in terms of a multi-year strategy there. And that's how we started cobbling together what ultimately ultimately became the broader Ameriflex solution. Okay. So was it the adjudication process itself was, was you felt was broken or you know, why was the TPA the bottleneck in your opinion? Well, a lot of it was paper driven. Okay. Um, Just all because it was an antiquated process, right? Right. And okay. then when you tied a, a lot of them, when they, you know, use a system to get a card or they try to integrate into a card processor, they just didn't have the wherewithal or knowledge to figure out how do I take this and remove more paper instead of adding more paper. Mm -hmm. And so the adjudication process is one of them. In the beginning, um, you know, everything had to be adjudicated. And the reason that th this thought of this white paper I wrote in the beginning was I believed that if more people had easier access to these funds, they'd use them. And before the arrival of the prepaid card, it was very difficult. You had to submit these claims from your FSA account to your HR department or some third party, and it was all manual and painful. Well, a lot of those companies that had the manual painful stuff before the technology arrived still had a lot of legacy systems, then, in my opinion, that could be consolidated, operationalized, and expanded. Okay. Um, and so I just knowing the world, knowing the systems, kind of knew that had a game plan to kind of roll these things up and build that. Well, have you always been a financial mind? I mean, I'm curious where the passion has come from for this particular field, because obviously you've you've dived in knee deep for a long period of time. I mean, where, where does this come from? What, what is the interest uh, for you? Because I find it fascinating, but, you know, most people would be like, what are they talking about? Yeah, so is, I'm yeah, curious, yeah, where, what, what's the driver here? I think it's a combination of dyslexia and ADHD, you know, in terms of always looking for the next thing okay. with a weird OCD focus on that I really believe we have the greatest healthcare system the world has ever seen. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. I love when I see reports about Estonia being the number one healthcare system in the world. And my first question is, what American is flying to Estonia for care? Exactly. No, nobody. How many Estonians are coming here? Probably a lot more. And so the issue that drives me that I look at this saying, we can solve this. We put, a, we put men on the moon in the 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, if we I have experiences in other healthcare systems, I did research for my book and then some other things, where other countries that have not accomplished the feat of sending men into space, never mind the moon, have, through their private sector, developed strategies with their EMRs and everything based around payments and cash that are much more efficient. So the passion comes from, it's like, this is a problem we can solve. Mm -hmm. I heard it recently that the healthcare system, and I forgot who said this, it's not my, my comment, but it, it, it makes a lot of sense, is working as it's designed. Exactly. So it's a matter of can we solve for the payment? That's what drives me. Everything that we build and everything else, we can solve for these things. Well, do you think the payment, the inefficiencies in the payment methodology are intentional or is it a byproduct of just improper design? You know, is it, is it a bug or a feature in, in the system? So um, I think it's a byproduct of the first thing that we can't talk about. Okay. People looking at health insurance incorrectly. It's not People say this time, it's not health care. Well, that always gets that that always gets equated with one another. And even politicians will call it health care. I think Bernie Sanders is famous for calling it health care. No, you're talking about health insurance. But anyways, I digress. That's right. That's yeah. right. And so the best way I could use for anyone to understand that concept that's confused is when's the last time you saw an insurance policy jump out of a folder in an ER and save a person's life? Exactly. It's never happened. Yep. It's always people. It's always what people's products, you know, pharmaceuticals, the devices, training. And so that's the first problem we have. We, we're looking at health care wrong in terms of health insurance, I should say. Health insurance, insurance in general, is a risk mitigation tool. So that's the first problem. And so then it's a matter of how can we use a risk mitigation tool in the most efficient way possible? Well, we have models for this. Car insurance, home insurance, take any type of insurance. You, you go to your car insurance, and you're like, okay, what's the highest deductible I can afford if something catastrophic happens, and that's what I'm going to buy mm -hmm. to put my premium down. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it I'm going to take care of. In fact, how many people do you know, many, who decide not to file an insurance claim for their car because they know their rates are going to go up, and it's cheaper to go take care of the body work themselves. Exactly. But when it comes to health care, 
It's a different story, and it's story after story of these things. So first, of, in terms of how do we get health insurance to a model where it's most efficient, and I've actually debated friends of mine that are in the insurance business about that. If you get to the catastrophic, I believe you will actually make more money because you're not dealing with the little routine stuff that's mm-hmm. high probability cheap stuff versus low probability expensive stuff, and actually you'll be more efficient. Get that out of that and then make it where by where you do have to inject some sort of responsibility. People say, well, Will, healthcare is complex. Yeah, it is complex. But also other things that people do every day that's complex. Mortgages are complex. Mm-hmm. But I, this is what I know. If people don't have an incentive to ask the question, they won't. Mm-hmm. So that's where it starts. Getting insurance where it needs to be is catastrophic. And then drive the right incentive patterns, may it be tax advantaged, may it be otherwise, that drives individuals to at least ask. Well, so I'm curious. When you say getting health insurance to where it needs to be catastrophic, obviously my my world prior to what I do now uh, with RFP technology was stop loss. I'm very familiar with the notion of a catastrophic claim, but we're talking about a magnitude that's much higher than most individuals can afford. So a self-funded employer like yourself buys 100K deductible or whatever that may be. They can afford $100,000 or theoretically, and they're making that trade off for that risk assessment based on the deductible they choose. What does a catastrophic plan, in your opinion, look like for an individual? Mm, Great question. Well, so to kind of continue that point forward is I think it's something like most people are functionally uninsured because the deductible is too high in terms of where they are. And I think one thing that we have compared to other countries that's very unique, and, and, and there's, there's all kinds of debate around this, but we have, I believe, half of our population gets their health benefits. I'm not going to call it health insurance. I'm going to call it health benefits okay. from their employer. Now, there's reasons why that happened. World War II, wage freezes, we can go all the history and, and bore people to death. But that's I think, is a gift when we look at some other countries. Take Canada, take England, take Mexico. I'm familiar, very familiar with all three of those systems. They're very similar, um, but they have some uniqueness to it that I think we can draw from that we have a base that I look at and say, now I'm biased. I just, my, my companies distribute through employers, mm-hmm. but I'll put that bias out there. That if we look for ways to allow employers, step one, to supercharge the way that they can provide a benefit. And why do they provide benefits? To attract and retain talent. Let's supercharge that. Let's give the same tax deductible that we give to employers. Let's give that to individuals as well. And if we can conquer half of that, then we can look at, you know, the poor. We can look at Medicare. We can look at TRICARE. And, we, and the, you know, we can start tackling these things all at once versus all of it has to be lumped together. Okay. So when it comes to the cash traffic for the individual, well, I think there has to be some skin in the game for the individual. It's almost like, what's the right catastrophic for car insurance? What's the right catastrophic for home insurance? It depends, mm-hmm. really, on socioeconomic, economic, the value, all these different things. And so I think it's a matter of probably one size doesn't fit all because if I am a line worker, you know, a deductible of 500 may be too much. But if I am a white-collar CEO, deductible of 10000 may be too little compared to the premium threshold and where I am exactly, in terms of yeah. that. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. Okay. The, at the end of the day, I just know that if we can figure out the tools by which we can insert the stuff for the routine that makes it efficient and accelerates the payment, and I've got story after story of how that saved money by reducing the cost of payment acquisition, that will drive a better solution and, and while at the same time involving all the stakeholders, the patient, the healthcare provider, the physician, and if there's a third party involved in terms of, gosh, I've got this cash traffic I want to manage before I start paying claims – get everyone aligned, that has to drive a better solution than where we are today. Well, see, I, the reason I wanted to ask you that question is I've always had this notion in my brain. Again, you talk about inserting bias. I'm a stop-loss guy by heart. So the, my bias is towards that the, the arrangement of a stop-loss plan, the specific and the aggregate coverage. I've always thought, uh, similar to along your line of thinking, that we might be best suited having individuals on their own, in literally their own individual catastrophic plan or a st- have stop loss coverage. So the notion of a hundred thousand dollar deductible per person in the employer, perhaps the individual themselves could have a catastrophic plan. However, I think the, the main problem, like you said, unless you insert some sort of triage measures and other ways to pay underneath that deductible, everybody having a $10,000 or $15,000 individual deductible sounds cheap, obviously on paper, because the premiums are going to be really low for that. But how, do, how does the member pay for that? How do they do that without going bankrupt? I mean, those are, the, those are the problems we're talking about solving, which I think is a nice segue into direct primary care, right? Mm-hmm. The, the reason we're here today is I want to unpack that completely. 
Um, and you're obviously an advocate for it. So, you know, I, I don't know, should we go the Acresa route first or should we get into ECDC? What, what's your, t- help, help me catalog this in chronological order, please. Well, probably it makes sense to go the Acresa route okay. and, and the genesis of Acresa because now that feeds into much of what we're doing with the uh, ECDC. Now, I feel like I need a flow, we need to put a flow chart on the screen of all your businesses, man, just so we can keep track of it. But so Acresa, we're at Acresa now. So tell me, uh, what is Acresa? So Acresa is a software platform um, that's been a number of years in development in terms of allowing ultimately individuals, may they be associated to an employer or to other sort of association, being able to come in or as individuals, come in and select a healthcare, you know, primary care physician or a healthcare provider of their choice, and then being able to have different payment sources that can pay for that on a model that is a subscription base versus a fee for service base okay. as the baseline. So what category would you lump across into? Is it um, uh, steerage or concierge? What, what, what do you consider uh, that? Great question. And, and this is, we get this all the time. Sure. Yeah. Ultimately, I always like to put things in buckets because at least I can start there before I ask more questions about it. Ultimately, across is just an operating system. We don't define the plan. We don't define the pricing. We don't even know if they're good physicians, good healthcare providers, where they sit on the spectrum. That's not for us to decide. We're just the railroad and our partners take the system and they deploy their IP, their strategies, um, and it has the feature sets by which different entities, may they be individuals on their own, may they be individuals part of an employer, may you know, whatever it may be, the feature set to plug into to purchase and transact this type of primary care um, in this bucket. Interesting. Okay. Now, what came first, the aggressor or the interest in DPC? I'd have to say the interest, and I, and I didn't come up with DPC and, and, and whoever. Direct primary care, before anybody's wondering, what are they talking about? DPC, we love acronyms and insurance. Right. So direct primary care. Direct right? primary care. So back in 05, 06, we, uh, we built a system called drpricing.com. And uh, it actually, the way we constructed it, we became one of the largest websites overnight. We had to shut down for a number of reasons. But the goal there was all these people we saw were opening health savings accounts, more people were having FSAs, more HRAs were coming on the scene. And we figured that all this cash that can be used for pre-tax services, healthcare services, wouldn't it be great if we could connect physicians and healthcare providers that allow for them to target individuals with these accounts and then transact on a pre-tax basis for the individual and then you know provide that benefit from a cash basis versus the normal fee-for-service claims churn process. So that's where it began. Um, and along the way, we kept iterating around how can we build a system that can ultimately solve for the payment. Whatever mechanism it is, whatever strategy it is, that's not for us to decide. Our, our word is how do we connect the two people? quicker and faster and, and provide it be an experience, at least on the payment side that we're used to in other industries. And so that evolved to the point where then we, you know, the ACA arrives March 2010 um, through our advocacy government relations there. We're very involved in D.C. with everything that we do. Very familiar with that law. Um, was very involved in when it was coming down in terms of lobbying for specific things around consumerism. And the bet was after that was signed and had the distinction of reading the, the bill that companies were going to go self-insured, be more, more motivated at a rapid rate. Maybe before the ACA had to be 500 lives to make sense. Now, if you look at the market, there's level funded plans of two, right? Mm-hmm. And that genesis were like, okay, doctor pricing, cash, people going self-insured, more risk being managed by the company, the CFO's thinking about this. And we started just watching our Ameriflex portfolio, watching the self-insured threshold come down because we know what they're doing from a compliance standpoint with Cobra and some other things. And then we started getting the phone calls early 2011, 2012, 2013, where companies were saying, hey, we just cut a deal with our physician down the street and we need help moving the payments. Okay. And so that's began the genesis of taking all that knowledge, all that world of experience and starting to build a system that could facilitate that. Now, is that something that is distributed through a particular channel? Is that a broker channel? Is it a direct to employer product, the Acresta solution? You know, is it both? Tell me who you're selling to. Gosh, great question. So we have tried different channels and ultimately where we have landed on that's been the most successful and is driving the Acresta growth is entities that have tried you know, direct primary care, advanced primary care, prospective primary care. There's a number of names for ultimately, which is a monthly subscription primary care. 
and the entities that have tried. So there's three, kind of two main buckets. Entities that have tried and not been successful because they didn't have the infrastructure to manage all the iterations have been our power users and, and our top flight clients that have come to us. Actually, it's kind of a great sales model. They call us and say, hey, we tried this and we got 3,000 participants and we're drowning. Great, install a Cressa and life's much better for them. To the second bucket where it's individuals that want to do it and they realize they need an industrial strength operating system to deploy it because maybe they've experienced in Medicare Advantage networks or whatever it may be. Those are the groups that take that have really seen the power and really enjoyed it. It's fueling the growth. The groups that like it, like the concept of it, um, but they're not quite sure where to start, mm-hmm. not a good play for, for a Cressa in terms of an operating system. Okay. So then... Obviously, now we've touched on a number of types of primary care, direct primary care. You know, move me forward to, what is it, Employers Coalition of Direct Care. I want to make sure I get that right, ECDC. So now we're talking about a nonprofit that's lobbying on, on behalf of this industry. So walk me through that, um, you know, where did this come from? Where did this notion of, now I've identified I need to start talking to Congress or I need to start talking to the IRS about this. So t- tell me what happened there. Yeah, so when we dove into this, we're very well versed in the compliance of, um, FSA accounts, HRAs, and HSAs. I mean, we this is what we do for a living. So we have a whole compliance department and all these different things and sit on these boards in D.C. And and what we realized very quickly is that whoever came up with the, the, the DPC acronym, very smart and very much better at marketing than I'll ever be. And the good news is, I think if you say DPC today, unlike maybe 24, 36 months ago, people have a semblance of what it is. So that's a, that's a victory, I think, for the, the market in terms of what we're talking about. The bad news is, is that the government now has a definition of what DPC is. And because, um, and there's some great people doing some great work, Jay Keyes and DPC Coalition, and a lot of people doing a lot of great work around here. But what happened was the IRS issued a, a letter saying that they believe DPC is insurance. Okay. And the reason that's problematic is that if it's insurance, you can't have it play with an HSA account. So when we... Well, so when you... Hold on, I want to ask the question, though. Um, you said the bad news was that the government came up with... Did, was it their own definition? Did somebody feed them a poor definition? Where, why was it a bad definition they had? So, candidly, I think it was a matter of a number of people trying to do, do good, but having their own beliefs of what DPC is, which is fine. Because there's not like a universal definition of what DPC is. And so the government looked at this and said, well, there's no definition. I'll give you an example. I, I testified a number of times in front of the IRS. But one time I testified to the IRS specifically on this issue. And they asked me a direct question. They said, William, our issue is that it's not defined. We need it defined in order to not call it insurance. And because of that, they said, well, look, we're going to blanket this because – we will, you know, we have to have a way to define it so we can, you know, allocate for it. And what's the tax implication of these things as it applies to these other rules? See, it's all this, the, the issue with all these things. You're dealing with previous guidance, regulation, other law, and it's a matter of that when the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, scores these things, the agencies score these things. They have to have a playbook they can go back to and say, aha, yes, that that's here, and our estimate is going to be multi billions of dollars, which is never correct, but that doesn't the point. <laughs> they still need to have a place where they can go and say it's defined. Okay. And so because of no definition or multiple definitions, they basically threw their hands up in the air and said, fine, it's insurance. That's what it sounds like. Um, and there's another commentary around that, how they came to that conclusion. Okay. So your point is, though, obviously it's not insurance. So how do you how do you uh, then push back against that notion? What are you doing with the lobbying perspective? Where does ECDC fit into sure. this uh, puzzle? Well, so I think that, you know, to answer that question, when we saw these things, we didn't see anybody that was advocating for the employer. Mm-hmm. And we know employers very well in terms of what we do in all of our business lines, maybe payroll or Ameriflex or whatever it may be. And so we felt the need that we needed to have the voice of the employer heard. And I think the reason the employer voice was missing from this is that there there is a, a movement that there shouldn't be an employer-based benefits. I, I get that. I understand that argument. I, I look at it slightly different, but at the same time, employers want to offer benefits to attract and retain talent. So that's why we started the ECDC, to get the employer's view on this in there to help okay. drive the conversation. Okay. Well, it's funny that the, the employer's point of view often gets lost uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, I, I've dealt in the insurance space, I've called on brokers for a number of different things, and you forget sometimes that the employer ultimately is the one that's buying these solutions, and then their bottom line is impacted by the choice. So I, I applaud you for, for going down that path. How long has this uh, project been un- undertaken? It, were, were, did you start ECDC or did you join it? Um, tell me about the history there. 
Yeah, so we um, have a number of partners up in D.C., American Bankers, HSA Council being one that we worked heavily with, and we sit on their board for Ameriflex. So ultimately, we looked at our partners and said, hey, we're going to start this. So we did start it. It is a 501c, non-for-profit, you know, it's just a, you know, and anyone can join. It's not limited to anyone or not. But the focus is and the mission of it is to advocate for direct relationships, direct contracting uh, on behalf of the employers. Okay. And that's the genesis of all of it. Um, Are we making progress? Yeah. So we, we have. We've made quite a bit of progress. And so um, when we took some feedback from the IRS about definition, we, we dove back into the ACA. And we dove back into some follow-ups and agent enhancements and other regulations. And we came across um, what they're calling in the ACA. It's actually written in the ACA called direct medical care arrangements. Okay. And it can get real complicated really quickly in terms of, you know, what is and isn't and falls in 213D qualification and playing with 106 in terms of employer plans and all these things. But, yes, uh, we've made a lot of progress. We're not there where we, we're not done yet. There's a, still some bills that we're still helping to support. Uh, Cassidy's got Senator Senator Cassidy's bills was one of them where we want to expand DPC to avoid this insurance definition for sure but along the way we found ways in terms of uh, that fit in the current guidance to provide some subscription based primary care that can not well, that so can once it gets outside hopefully your, your your goal is achieved it's no longer classified as insurance what does it become or what do you what would you like it to be scheduled as well ultimately what are we talking about when we're talking about this? we're talking about alternative payment Right. And so when we break down ultimately in a transaction between a patient and a physician, the physician and, or the healthcare provider is always taking the risk. They've always taken it. May it be a accounts receivable risk they're taking in terms of financial payments. May it be in terms of the health risk. They're always the guys or gals taking the risk. And so what we're talking about is how do we take it where those that are at the, you know, the closest to managing the risk give them the opportunity to manage all of it, including the financial component. Okay. So ultimately, it's a matter of getting what does success look like? Where are we moving? Success looks like is that if I'm an individual and I have a pre-tax account, I should be able to go into my primary care physician, my primary care provider, and I should be able to whatever type of payment program or payments they are charging me, I'm able to to pay for it without issue. If I'm an employer and I'm building a program, I got my stop loss, I've got my deduct, my individual deductibles, all this type of risk I'm managing, different subsets of risk. If I want to help pay for primary care, because every study we look at, if people have a primary care physician or healthcare provider, they're engaged in primary care best practices, they're going to be healthier. I mean, it's just kind of like it's breaking it's a no down. Brainer, right? It's a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah. Why would we have any barriers to allow for that to occur, no matter who's paying for it? Mm -hmm. May that be the government paying for it through a Medicare or Medicaid program. And they have, there are some Medicare programs coming out, or I think they're, well, they're close to being out. Um, there's some Medicaid talk as well in different states. TRICARE, you know, all these things. Why wouldn't we do that? Mm -hmm. And so ultimately get these payments out of the claims administrative cost that's driving up cost. Mm -hmm. Get that out of little stuff, high probability stuff. Get that out. Mm -hmm. Get that direct. You need cash traffic hit by a bus? Okay. Well, we all agree on that. Yep. But how often do you get hit by a bus? Well, probably just once, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And you need insurance. Yeah, yeah. So well, that's what it looks like. Well, and it's funny. I had a conversation with a gentleman at, uh, I think it's uh, Peak Med uh, last week. I think they're in that, that the direct primary care space. And we were talking about a situation where my daughter had, uh, she was a three, three at the time, had an unfortunate backyard trampoline incident, uh, broke her little arm. Nothing, nothing super serious, but we knew she needed to go to the emergency room. Um, didn't, don't have an arrangement, don't have any sort of direct primary care that we can access. Of course, also at the time, the closest urgent care became an ER at like seven o'clock at night. Right. So we're looking up, well, I'm not going to go uh, price shop, you know, in an emergent situation. So we go there and of course it's like, well, based on your deductible. And since it's an ER, it's 1300 bucks or whatever the case may be. Now, whether or not that actually could have been treated by a direct primary care physician that was available via text or FaceTime where I could have come in. I don't know, but it ended up being nothing showed up on the x-ray. They cast it as a preventative measure. Three weeks later, the cast is off and she's perfectly fine. The assumption was it probably was broken, but they didn't want to take the risk. Now, I was okay. Like, fortunately, we were able to deal with that situation, pay the out-of-pocket expense and just eat it. It is what it is. I would have loved an alternative option. And I think maybe that might have been on the cusp of whether or not that could have been treated in a direct primary care setting. But even if we're talking about, oh, I've got a cut on my finger and I need two or three stitches, a lot of people will just go directly for, to the ER for that. 
based on how their plan is designed, based on the charges, you could be talking thousands upon thousands of dollars. Well, a stitches, I'm assuming in a direct primary care setting, just included in your monthly costs, right? And that's probably the stitches may cost 50 cents to put in your hand. To me, that's there's such an obvious direct ROI in that solution. That's why I, I get passionate about this stuff. I get passionate about self-funding. So, you know, where do we go from here, though? What's the what, what's the future of getting this to be at a critical mass where everybody's just thinking, oh, of course we have direct primary care? Mm-hmm. Well, I think, um, I mean, healthcare moves at the speed of molasses in January, right, up in mm-hmm. Minnesota. So, mm-hmm. um, and then you have the plan years and you have all the stuff. And so it's just, it is a long haul. Mm-hmm. It is not something that's going to turn over night. But if I think in terms of answering your question to start with, where we've come in the last 36 months is pretty amazing okay. in terms of what Good. we're seeing. And I think, you know, the opportunity is, you know, Kleenex is a tissue, but it's a brand that people associate with being a tissue. It's strange. Even though it's not a Kleenex, you'll still have, ask pass me a Kleenex and it could be you know, Acme tissues. I think we're starting to, people are starting to more and more understand that this is something that they begin to appreciate and understand. Now, maybe is it different forms of direct primary care? Is it direct primary care from a physician? I think that's an option. Could it be we're seeing opportunities for urgent care facilities that are using a Cressa to say, you know what, we're going to offer a subscription-based model and put it, you know, and manage it uh, on the, in the ecosystem? That's interesting. I think different things are starting to happen. And if we open up the opportunity where people can pay for it, employers can pay for it governments can pay for it and you know give them an extra little bonus in terms of taxes okay great i mean we can talk about taxes driving behavior all the time cigarette taxes gas taxes or whatever it is i think that's the opportunity by getting it more efficient and solving for the payment more people will jump into it so for example you know i had a physician buddy of mine tell me that when he files a claim he's a primary care physician actually he just recently retired to 40 because he didn't want to do it anymore which is kind of an interesting story in itself but he's like he was paying between 8 and 15% to acquire the primary care transaction. Okay. I mean, that's pretty tremendous mm-hmm. in terms of, yeah, okay, credit card fees and everything else, but 8 to, eight to 15%. That's, you know, crazy for something that maybe, to your point, he would have charged cash $50 to do some stitches or whatever it may be. So I think that two things are happening. One is you see the market movement with this and solve for the payment. Two, the cost of care is not getting cheaper in terms at least the gross charges are not getting any cheaper. Exactly. And so you have this convergence where more and more um, companies, more and more individuals are like, wait a minute, I need something else. So, for example, medical sharing programs. Yeah. How many people knew about those 36 months ago? No, I don't know, but I, can, I remember maybe 12 to 18 months ago driving around and on you know talk radio hearing about MediShare or whatever the ones that are out there. That I guess there's some Christian-based uh, health sharing, sharing networks as well. I don't know much about them, admittedly, but you're right. I did two years ago, three years ago, didn't hear about them. Heard about them all the time advertised on the radio about 18 months ago. And there's, you know, there's a, there's a couple here based in Dallas. There's a Sedera down in Austin, you know, doing some great stuff. I mean, these are things that literally I'm in the industry and probably 36 months ago, if you were to say, hey, what do you think of medical sharing? And I'd be like, what are you talking about? What are you talking uh, yeah. about? Right. Yeah. So I, I think it's a matter of from where we sit in terms of what we're doing, can we continue to push where more and more weapons are opened up that allow for different ways for this to be known as well as different ways to pay for it? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of neat stuff occurring um, with some, uh, you know, uh, convenient pharmacy companies in terms of what they're trying to do in terms of like Walgreens and CVS and Kroger's and Walmart and all these things that are occurring. So I think ultimately for it to get mainstream is that it's a matter like everything else. You, you know, I think Winston Churchill said it best. Americans always do the right thing after they tried and failed everything else. Mm-hmm. I think we're reaching the, the point where we're trying all kinds of stuff and we need to do something the right thing, which just allocate one piece of it at a time. Get the primary care, make it meaningful for everyone to be involved in a direct relationship with a primary care physician or provider. Incentivize that. We know what the return on investment is that when you have a primary care physician, and then we can start tackling the other pieces. Back to tackling other pieces at a time. We have the employers. Maybe that's not the best solution. Maybe it is. I don't know. I do know that we have half the population insured through the employer. So if how, why can't we supercharge it if the employers continue to want to supplement to attract and retain? Because mm-hmm. if you go down to Mexico, Mexico employers will, as a benefit to attract you, even though they have a public system, they will supplement private care. Now, they don't have to do that. Before the ACA, you didn't have to do it here. But why do people do it? Because it's a competitive requirement, mm-hmm. right, wrong, or indifferent. So, so everything that we're doing is, okay, these things can happen at, at the global level, and then as, as a company, as a vision in terms of the companies that, we, that I have, 
we look at like how can we accelerate that and make it a transaction as fast as possible okay. versus you know the cost of acquiring the stitches which could take 30, 60, 90 days, and you're playing this gross charge game where, yeah, it costs $300 for the stitches, but I'll take 50 today. Yeah. So do you, I guess there's obviously going to be objections to this model. I mean, what are the, some that you commonly hear? What, you know, what do people go, oh, I don't know about that. What, what's, what's the thing that anybody would, would um, criticize this notion for? Is it, is it um, private sector factors? Is it insurance carriers perhaps pushing back? Or who, who if anybody, is really against what you're trying to do? Gosh, that's a great question. I, I think the biggest barrier is that um, not everybody is at a point or knows about it or is and from a physician standpoint, they're willing to take these type of payments. Okay. Now, candidly, it's not a new idea. It's an old idea. I mean, some people call it capitative payments. But I think what technology has allowed for, and we did a bunch of research before we, you know, as we were building a crest in terms of what needs to make this different from an old idea. And the number one thing we found for the participants is choice and change so that they don't feel like they're locked into somebody if they don't like them. They want to be able to have choice for their, for their spouse, pediatrics for the kids, and be able to have that roll up into an ability where then it can be synchronized and reconciled and then be able to change whenever they want. Only through software can you do that from a reconciliation of p having the payment follow behind it, and, and it's what we do very well at Acres on that component. That component, I think, is critical. So what's, what's the barrier? I think people say, well, great. Is my doctor in? You know, is he in? It, well, I don't, well, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's been the biggest thing. Um, but in terms of regulations, in terms of employers, in terms of everyone we talk to, I think I'd be hard pressed to find someone that would sit down and say, you know what, that sounds like a terrible idea. I don't want to do that. Did the physicians have concern about it? Is there concern of a loss of income perhaps um, by switching models or are you having to convince them that they're not going to be or at least not kept whole if they'd move to this? Because I'm sure being in some big networks and things like that, you know, they know what they can bill versus what they're going to get paid. Is that a uh, concern? Um, so I'll, I'll quote my dad. He said, he said, physicians are the only people he knows that get together to, to globally lower their prices. Um, so I thought that was always kind of hilarious. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, what we've seen is that specifically in the primary care world is that when there is a, a hole in our ecosystem that an employer or group has needs filled. So we have uh, an employer that came on through one of our partners and our partner um, needed to fill in Springfield, Missouri. So we have a network development team that helps our partners add physicians or healthcare providers to their offering, to their, to their, their, their offering of DPC or whatever they're calling it. And we, just like in that case and every other case, when our guys call up and gals and say, we have 25 people that are each worth $75 a month for you to do these listing of routine primary care pieces. They're non-Medicare, they're non-Tricare, they're non-Medicaid, they're employed. These are all factors in terms of how healthy they're going to be at some level from an actuarial standpoint. Um, we've never had anyone say no. Okay. Um, the issue is like, well, how do I make this work in all the infrastructure I've invested in for fee-for-service in my claims turn? Um, but there are partners of ours that have done a, an amazing job, even though they have a huge fee-for-service programs and their ACO networks have been able to teeter on it and actually develop um, their own, some call it direct primary care, some call it advanced primary care. There, you know, there's a number of names for the same thing, uh, with differences, of course, um, to be able to stat straddle both lines. But it's, it's, it's kind of a tipping point type issue. Well, how many people am I going to get? If I start doing the infrastructure to take this type of payment versus what I'm used to and I've optimized, at least I think I've optimized. And so it, that's why it hasn't been universal. I mean, I think we have, let's say we have 10,000 physicians and healthcare providers across the country through our partners. I mean, that's nothing, right? I mean, 10,000 is a lot, but if you think about all the physicians and providers, RNs, PAs that are out there, that's still nothing in terms of the global piece. We're seeing incremental great growth across the piece, but it's because of, wait a minute, you know, yeah, we may have X amount of, you know, thousands of people, patients on the system, but they're not 100,000 in Wichita, Kansas, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's... So are they operating on two different systems or supplementing it with the DPC style arrangement in addition to the fee-for-service, and then hopefully you see that maybe a transition more full. Okay, and then, then you go, well, now I've got 60 or 70% of my payments this way. Maybe I do away with fee-for-service. Is that the long term or, or no? Will yeah. it always Well, exist? so we've got partners, um, sizable partners that have 
publicly stated, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn uh, on this, they have said, we're going to move all to these types of payments, um, and, you know, in terms of, or we want to move these types of things. And, mm -hmm. and I, I'm not 100% sure if they said it publicly, but it's one of our big partners that is a hospital system, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll protect the innocent. But they have both. You can go to their website, and you can see that they have a direct primary care program um, that you can sign up as an individual. They have it for groups. They're also promoting it, too. They've been very successful in this. And then they have their ACO. And what you know they're looking at is saying, look, we have this awkward phase. We have a you know we have built all this for fee for service, but we know how much more valuable this is because we're able to manage all the risk ourselves, and we're in the best position to manage that risk, both the financial as well as the clinical. Why not? Why not get us the payment to do that and reward us to do that? So I think it's a matter of what's keeping this from going. Well, it's a chicken and egg problem. The participants and the employers, the people that are the purchasers, whoever that may be, they need to be able to buy this. And there's some things that need to happen for this to occur in market, maybe self-insured or otherwise, which we can talk about. That's of interest. And then you have the other side says, okay, I need to post myself up in this space, but I have to decide when am I going to actually do that and take away resources and energy from my current model. Now, a lot of DPC purists where I say you can't do both. We, we have partners that do both actually. We call them hybrids. I think they've been pretty successful. They keep getting people renew with them. Um, but maybe, you know, focus on one or the other. Always focus is better. But that's what's demarcating down that if 98% of the people, physicians, providers are in a CRESA are hybrids yeah. because they can't do one or the other. They can't go cold turkey. Um, but they want to go full. If you were to ask them, if you were to sit with one of the physicians or CFOs or whatever, they say, no, no, we want direct payments all day long, and we're willing to invest to have the infrastructure even before it comes. Mm -hmm. But you got to have the membership, right? That's the, the membership. chicken in the egg. Yeah, That's so right. I, I understand the challenge now, I think, a little bit better. Um, so, you know, where, where yeah, I would I always ask the question, where do we go from here? What's the future of this? I mean, I think you've, you've obviously laid that out pretty, pretty well. Do you see the expansion of the types of services that would then fit under the DPC moniker at some point? You know, av after we get critical mass of membership, then do we just broaden the, the list of services that are accommodatable in that setting or, or what? No, that's exactly it. I mean, we, ta we targeted uh, primary care for specifically for that reason, that if we can make the biggest bang um, by having these, moving these to payments, helping to facilitate direct payments to primary care physicians and primary care providers, that would have the biggest impact. They then can drive other pieces. May that be, quote, you know, it's a big thing, popular thing, bundled payments, whatever that may be. Um, and, you know, move upstream, move into, uh, we have partners that develop cardiology programs, uh, OBGYN, well, women programs. A lot of women get their primary care from their OBGYN. Um, you know, moving these kind of up level to then to the point of um, we're doing some beta work in terms of, well, gosh, you know, bundled payments. And the big thing with the bundled payments is where do I send all the payments for all the people that were touching it? And then how does that payment line up with something that can be digested for utilization rates? Well, that's a, you know, in our mind, that's, a, that's a, a database problem in terms of, okay, you know, we can move payments and we can actually allocate those correctly in terms of someone inputting that has the incentive to input it. And the reason the incentive is there is because it's faster. Um, we're not making those de decisions. We're just kind of making the weapons for it. So where do we go from here? Well, we're continuing to go on and, you know, continuing to have partners that are using the system, deploying their IP, growing tremendously. It's not like going to earth shadow anyone right now, mm -hmm. um, but it's a matter of every sales cycle, the interest and the growth continues to occur. Mm -hmm. And the chicken and egg problem, in order to really survive in what we do, you got to have the staying power, you got to have the capital, you got to have to be stubborn with it. And this is not something that's going to be a startup that's going to, you know, rocket ship in 12 months. Mm -hmm. This is a 60 month play. And Six, 60? 60. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, just because of the sales cycle, you have the movements behind it. And we're very confident um, based on what's already happened, what's in the pipeline, what we see happening next year, that, you know, 36 months ago, 10% knew what DPC was, making the total up. And now we're up in the total population at 20%. And maybe in our industry, it's up to 80%. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think another 36 months in the future, everyone's going to have to look at it from, you know, what am I doing in direct primary care? And I'll give you the example. Um, health savings accounts. When health savings account came out, no one knew what the hell it was. Within 36 months, really after the first year, everybody had a plan. You had to have a plan. And they've grown from there. This is very similar in the trajectory what I'm seeing 
in terms of adoption, understanding. And the thing you know that's missing, that's, uh, that's a big number one misser in a market that hasn't developed this, is wrapper programs. Okay. The markets that are more successful that we've seen with partners are the guys that have, and gals, that have either partnered with the health plan or they've developed their own plan, and they've said, look, we're going to appreciate what's occurring by paying primary care, stop losses, appreciate, and the, the guys and gals and companies that have been bundled that together and then deployed, very successful mm -hmm. and having great growth. The guys are kind of piecing it together and haven't quite got the wrapper program around it or whatever it may be. Um, and my prediction is 36, 60 months from now, major health plans, everybody's going to have that high up the health plan HSA program, part two, which is the wrapper program with a direct primary care type arrangement built into it. Well, I, cer I certainly hope you're right, and I I'm pulling for you there. If anybody is interested, we've obviously touched on a number of businesses, Ameriflex, Acresa, um, you know, Workforce Go, we didn't get in too much. But um, if anybody wants to get a hold of you wants, or wants to get a hold of somebody that can talk to them about the solution in more detail, where should they go? Um, probably the easiest way to get a hold of me is um, either LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm actually trying to be pretty good in answering my LinkedIn direct messages. And then um, shoot me an email at uh, wshort at myameriflex.com or wshort at acressa.com. Okay, awesome, man. Well, Will, I appreciate you uh, coming on. This has been enlightening. I knew it was going to be difficult. I mean, there, I see a number of questions on here that I probably would have wanted to ask, but due to the time constraint, and I don't want this to be a, a, a three-hour podcast, even though people listen to Rogan for three hours, why didn't they listen to this for three hours? Uh, but either way, man, I do appreciate you stopping by. Hopefully, maybe we'll get together again sometime and have some updates on, on your progress that you're making in this space. Uh, but until we do that, keep up the good fight, man, and I look forward to talking to you soon. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Will.